other name. He's my Lord. He's your Lord. He's our Lord, Jesus the Christ, wherever you are. If you believe it, would you say amen? Every day this week, we'll glean, gain, and get lessons from the life of David. Today, we'll investigate David's sin. Tomorrow, we'll relate with David's shame. On Tuesday, we'll associate with David's supplication. Uh, if you're still with us on Wednesday, we'll castigate David's silence on Thursday, we'll appreciate David's song. On Friday, we'll commiserate over David's son. And then on Sabbath, we will celebrate David's seed. Now, here is the disclaimer for today. That whilst the content does indeed come from the Bible, some viewers here on Zoom might find the themes discussed upsetting and distressing. The story I'm about to share with you contains violence, sex, and deception. Now, parents, please be advised. That now, if you are still with me, let's get into God's word. Did you know that David's name is mentioned more times than any other name in the Bible? More than Abraham, which appears 231 times more than Moses, which appears 848 times, even more than Jesus, which appears 977 times. David's name appears in the Bible 1,085 times. Probably the most famous story of David is the story of David and Goliath. From this event in his life, we learn what we ought to do when facing the enemy. But today, we'll be studying David's most infamous story, an episode in his life where we learn what we ought not do. We will also discover that we can be our own worst enemy. And so if you dare accompany me in this scandalous story, navigate your way to the second, uh, second book, Second Samuel, uh, chapter 11, verses, uh, verses 14 through to 17. That's Second Samuel, chapter 11, verses 14 through to 17. There you will find the following words. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were and the men of the city were out. They went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. I've tagged this text with the title, Someone Has to Die. Someone Has to Die. David is in Jerusalem. Ordinarily, this would not be a problem, for Jerusalem is the city of David, and Jerusalem is the capital city of God's people, and Jerusalem was where the palace was, where David lived. David is in Jerusalem. The reason why this is a problem, the, the reason why David's location is a complication is found in the very first verse of 2 Samuel 11. Go there with me. Uh, this is our chapter of study this morning. There it records, and it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. 
This was the time when kings go forth to battle. Kings went to battle at the beginning of the year. Uh, that's why the King James Version says, after the year was expired. That's why the English Standard Version says, in the spring of the year. Literally, the Hebrew says, in the return of the year, or when the year returns. Winter had come with its cold self, and so winter was never the time for warfare, for in the winter it was too cold, and in the winter there was too much rain. There wouldn't have been any grass for the horses to eat, and there wouldn't have been enough food supplies for the armies to survive. That was the winter, but the winter had come and gone. Now it is spring, the beginning of the year, the return of the year. And this was the return to warfare for the Israelite army against the Ammonite army. The Ammonites were no match for the Israelites, and so the Ammonites had joined forces with the Syrians against Israel. Israel had destroyed and defeated the Syrians. And so the Ammonites retreated to their capital city called Rabbah. Rabbah was surrounded and protected by city walls. The Israelite army had already captured and conquered the rest of the country. It was just this capital city that was standing in the way of a complete and comprehensive victory. But it would only be a matter of time before the Ammonites would suffer the same fate as their Syrian allies. And so the Ammonites were there hiding within their walls. They trusted that they were sheltered and shielded by these walls, but Israel had besieged them. All God's people had to do was to wait. For when you besiege a city, the people inside the city walls either die of starvation or surrender voluntarily. But fortunately for the Ammonites, Winter had come. And so David, the king, Joab, his captain, and all the armies of Israel returned to Jerusalem. Uh, understand that this was not a retreat. This was just delaying the inevitable. For 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 14 in your Bible reports, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Oh, what a feeling to know that with David the king fighting from the forefront, that victory was already secure. The problem was when the time came for kings to return to battle, David remains at home. David could have reasoned, victory is certain. It will be a good experience and exposure for Joab, his captain, who was also his nephew, uh, however, this was not the time for captains. It was not the time for soldiers. It, it was not the time for warriors. This was the time for kings to go forth to battle. But, verse 1, in your Bible, 2 Samuel 11 says, but uh, there's a problem when we're supposed to be somewhere and we're supposed to do something, but his soldiers were in battle, but... David was still in Jerusalem. His army was fighting, but David was relaxing. His people were at war, but David was at rest. Whilst the men of Israel were out killing the enemy, the king of Israel was at home killing time, reclining, dining, and unwinding. You don't, but don't, don't expect your enemy to always be clad in armor. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. You must have heard it said, an idle mind is the devil's workshop, meaning that inaction and idleness ultimately become the most active cause of evil. There is a Turkish proverb which says that the devil tempts all other people, but that idle men tempt the devil. Hmm. David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's late in the afternoon and David has just arisen from his midday siesta. Uh, the heat and humidity in this part of the world means that it's normal to take a nap in the middle of the day. 
but it's still very hot. And so David takes a walk on his palace roof. It's better up here because there's a cool breeze, but unbeknown to David is that he is about to be in heat. He looks out from his rooftop to admire the nature of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Up above, there's the clear and cloudless blue skies stretching from one end to the other. Over there on that mountainous slope, trees which will soon be laden with dates, figs, olives, and pomegranates. In that vineyard of grapes, uh, there they will grow. In, in those fields, there will be barley. And down below, ah, down below, is that a woman? Is she bathing? Man, she's beautiful. Fearfully and wonderfully made, if I do say so myself. Why would she be washing in my line of vision? Surely she must know that I can see her. Uh, maybe she wants me to see her. Maybe she wants me. And so David allows his mind to wander. He allows the temptation of the invisible enemy to foster and to fester in his mind. Whilst Bathsheba is the one bathing her body, David is the one dirtying his mind. Let me tell you something this morning. A lustful thought may come into your mind, but you can choose to chase it away. Temptation isn't sin, but when you give in to temptation and have been overcome by temptation, then that is sin. David has contemplated it up here. And so he's been stimulated down there. Over and over again, he replayed and repeated in his mind the things that he would say to her and the things that he would do to her if only he had the opportunity. But hold on a minute. I am the king. I can have anything and everything I want. All I have to do is say the word and my wish is my servant's command. And so verse 3 of 2 Samuel 11 records... And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Uh, understand that this woman named Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah, one of David's most valuable and loyal warriors. She was the daughter of Eliam, one of David's most trusted mighty men. And she was the granddaughter of Ahithophel, one of David's royal advisors. But none of this made a difference to David. He was not deterred. He was not discouraged. He was not dissuaded. David had decided to commit this crime. Take note of this. David's sin was not seeing Bathsheba, but David went from seeing to looking and from looking to watching. What's the difference between seeing, looking and watching? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. First, David saw Bathsheba bathing. He noticed her. He became aware that she was there, but he not only saw, he looked. His eyes are now directed to her. He pays her particular attention, not knowing that he'll soon be paying the price. And so he goes from looking to watching. His attention is not only directed, but he's fixated. He's not only seeing, but he's thinking. And so here's the problem. Wrong thinking leads to wrong living. Uh, you can uh, tweet that, you can hashtag that. Uh, there's no copyright, just your rights to copy. I'll say it again if you missed it. Wrong thinking leads to wrong living. David has a surge of emotion and an urge for sexual gratification, but you should never allow your emotions or your hormones or your passions or your feelings to dictate to you what you ought to do. You are not an animal. You are created in the image of a holy God. 
Emotions have their place, but when they are in contradiction and in opposition to the word of God, don't follow your feet. We have this counsel on page 50 of the Adventist home. Love is not unreasonable. It is not blind. It is pure and holy. But the passion of the natural heart is another thing altogether. While pure love will take God into all its plans and will be in perfect harmony with the spirit of God, passion will be headstrong. She goes on and says that passion will not only be headstrong, but rash, unreasonable, defiant of all restraint and will make the object of its choice an idol, end quote. Unfortunately, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse number four reports and David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. This was a moment of pleasure for a lifetime of pain. We're not told about any flirting or foreplay. Uh, we're not told about any persuasion or subduction. We're not told about one thing leading to another. The fact of the matter is that David's intention was clear. Even before the act was committed, he had been convicted of sin. Why send for Bathsheba when you know she's married? But David wanted so badly to engage in a lay activity. Hey, it's, it's early in the morning here. Some of you will get that a little later. Uh, stay with me as we see that a single act can change the course of your life. It's going to be noteworthy to know uh, that the single verse has a knock-on effect for the rest of David's story, as we're going to see this week, and the story of all those who are near and dear to him. Maybe you missed it. Go to 2 Samuel 11, stay there. Verse 4 informs us that Bathsheba was purified from her uncleanness. Bathsheba wasn't just bathing. She was ceremonially cleansing herself because of her period of menstruation. Now, why on earth would this personal detail be recorded publicly in scripture? Let me give you three reasons. These three reasons prepare you for the following verse. Firstly, it tells us that she is not pregnant prior to her intimacy with David. Secondly, it tells us that intercourse with David takes place precisely at the most opportune time for conception. And thirdly, it tells us that since Uriah is off in the battlefield, he cannot possibly be the father. This is a small phrase, but with big implications. And so verse five follows and reports, and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, the mistake would be to think that David's sin is only a problem because Bathsheba is pregnant. But this pregnancy is a result of a sinful action. And the action was the result of sinful thoughts. You need to know that your sin is not only serious when others find out about it, but your secret sins are just as deadly, perhaps even more so, because you think you can get away with it. Uh, my favorite author writes in manuscript releases, number 369, a man may be guilty of sins which God alone knows. Knows. God's law is indeed a searcher of hearts. There are dark passions of jealousy and revenge and hatred and malignity, lust and wild ambition that are covered up from human observation. And the great I am knows it all. Sins have been contemplated and yet not carried out for the want of opportunity. God's law makes a record of all these, these hidden away secret sins form character. The law of God condemns not only what we have done, but what we have not done. There ends the quote. 
David wouldn't have been guilty of this sin of commission if he hadn't been guilty of his sin of omission. For on the battleground where he was supposed to be, there were no naked women bathing. He should have and would have and could have been fighting for God's glory. But instead of fighting the enemy, he's going to be covering up his stupidity. Understand, Bathsheba is not informing David of her pregnancy because she wants child support or so that they can schedule a baby shower. She's sharing this news because her life is at risk and the life of David is at risk. For the Bible mandates in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, the man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. However, David seems not to be concerned with his transgression, but his reputation. You need to know that there's a difference between reputation and character. Reputation is what others think about you. Character is who you really are in the sight of God. Now, this can work one of four ways. You may have a good reputation because of your good character, or you may have a bad reputation because of your bad character. But more worryingly than this is having a good reputation, but God knowing the wickedness in your heart. Unfortunately, this is where David finds himself in this episode in his life. It is also possible to have a bad reputation, but God knows the purity of your heart. Uh, to Jacob's sons, Joseph had a bad reputation. Uh, to Pharaoh, Moses had a bad reputation. To Queen Jezebel, Elijah had a bad reputation. To Herodias, John the Baptist had a bad reputation. To the Catholic Church, Martin Luther had a bad reputation. To the Jewish leadership and the Roman authorities, Jesus had a bad reputation. But their bad reputation was the result of their good character. What we ought to desire is to have a good reputation as a result of a good character. But even if we have a bad reputation, let it not be because of our bad character. May it be because a good thing is a bad thing to a bad person. What David should have done was plead to God for forgiveness, asking God to transform his character. But rather than change his character, David tries to protect his reputation. What if? David thinks to himself, Uriah causes a rebellion and an uprising in Israel. The irony is that the one who is disloyal is disturbed by the one who is loyal. That the one who is unfaithful is upset about the one who is faithful. That the one you can't trust is the one who is troubled by the one who is trustworthy. David should have gone to God in prayer, but this was problematic. For when we pray to God, we must ask for God's will to be done, not our own will. But he knew God was concerned with his character whilst he was preoccupied with his reputation. For David to go to God in prayer, he would first have to admit that he has done wrong. That he has horribly and terribly sinned against Bathsheba and against Uriah and against his wives. You, you do know that David at this time uh, had seven wives and, and he, only, he not only sinned against them, but against his soldiers and against his subjects. And of course, even against God himself. God is a God of forgiveness when there is true repentance. But the truth is, uh, David wasn't looking for forgiveness. He was not sorry for his sin. He was just sorry for the consequences of his sin. And so David attempts to cover up his sin by ordering Uriah back to Jerusalem from the battlefield and by commanding Uriah to go home and have marital relations with his wife Bathsheba. But there's that word again, but. Uh, 
Uriah deems it unthinkable for him to return home until the mission has been accomplished. I don't have time this morning. Uh, he is resolute in his pursuit. He, he is uncompromising in his dedication, unwavering to his objective and unchanging to his charge. Uriah is living up to his name for the name Uriah means the Lord is my life. And even David's dark intentions could not hide this light. But David wasn't about to give up. He went on with his surreptitious strategy. The deceiving David devises the devilish downfall of a dependable, dutiful, devoted, and dedicated defender of the divine. Verse 13 in our Bibles of 2 Samuel chapter 11 records, and when David had called Uriah, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. Even a drunk Uriah, an intoxicated and an, e an inebriated Uriah, a uh, uh, boozed up, liquored up, woozy and tipsy, stumbling and staggering, seeing double Uriah, does not become complacent in his commitment to God. He does not go down to his house. It's intriguing to see how the same situation can bring about different responses to different people. Uh, how different people react in different ways to the same situation. The armies of Judah and Israel are in the middle of a battle, camped out in a field, and because of this, a drunk, Uriah goes to sleep next to his fellow soldiers in Jerusalem, but the same situation sees David sleep with Uriah's wife. What Uriah, this faithful foreigner, this steadfast soldier displayed and portrayed is what this world needs right now. Not drunk men, but even if drugged or drunk are principled and are not swayed by position or popular opinion. One of my favorite quotes from my favorite author says, the greatest want of the world is the want of men and women. I know that you, some of you are saying this out loud right now. Men and women who will not be bought or sold. Men and women who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men and women who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men and women whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men and women who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. This is not only a favorite quote of mine, but it's a favorite quotation of many. But do you know what the paragraph immediately following this quotation goes on to say? In case you don't, let me share it with you. Uh, she goes on to say, but such a character is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favors or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of love to God and man. We would miss a, a vital and a crucial preaching point in this chapter if we just focused on David's sin and David's selfishness and David's stubbornness without any regard to the integrity and incorruptibility of Uriah. Here is a Hittite, one who is not a Jew. He is a foreigner, but he comes to know and accept and embrace the true God of Israel. Even when the king of Israel gives him permission to go home, Uriah knows that there is a God in heaven who neither slumbers nor sleeps. It is to him that Uriah is responsible and accountable to. And even when the king of Israel gives him a day or two to change his mind, still Uriah is unmoved moving in his vow. He says to David, as thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And even when the king of Israel succeeds in getting him drunk, still Uriah is ready and steady to follow his convictions. Get this, Uriah has more integrity drunk than David does whilst he is sober. 
Let me let that digest for a moment. If you got that, you'll also get this. David was trying to control Uriah, but he couldn't even control himself. He's in this mess because he lacks self-control. David has failed failed to go to battle, failed to restrain himself from lustful thoughts, failed from keeping himself from acting on these lustful thoughts, failed in sending Uriah home to sleep with his wife. And even though David had succeeded in getting him drunk, he has failed in getting him to compromise on his commitment to God. And so now David has a choice, admit that he has committed a capital crime, condemning himself to death or order the death of one of his most noble, honorable, and valuable soldiers because of David's sin. Someone has to die. And even though David is guilty of sin, he would rather have the innocent pay the ultimate price for his sin. And so David writes a letter to Joab, verse 15 in the NIV says, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Now it's one thing for you to commit sin, but, but, but don't bring others into it. Don't let others be witnesses to your wickedness. Don't let others be supporters in your sin. Don't let others be compliant to your commandment breaking. Don't let others be complicit to your crime. Don't let others be spectators to your iniquity. Don't let others be participators in your immorality. But this cowardly king sends his own faithful soldier with his own death sentence. Uriah's bad news is David's good news. Uriah's termination is David's jubilation. Uriah's death is David's delight. Fighting against the Amorites didn't even make sense. The very point of a siege is to wait for the people inside the city walls to either die of starvation or surrender voluntarily. No one had to die in battle, but David's sin meant that someone has to die. Uriah, the faithful and humble servant, the one whose name means the Lord is my light, the one who is innocent, dies because of the sins of the guilty. And so a messenger is sent with the report from the battlefield to the palace, from Joab to David. And so here is the report. Uriah, the Hittite, is dead. When Bathsheba hears this, she mourns for her husband for seven days. And after these seven days, David brings her again from her house to make to his palace and makes her his wife, number eight. Now understand that this act of marrying Bathsheba uh, to the whole of Israel would have been seen as truly noble as I'm wrapping up. David's reputation would have escalated. David would have been admired and adored for he has just assumed the role of kinsman redeemer since Uriah was a foreigner who had no near kinsman living in Israel. David assumes the lifelong responsibility of caring for the needs of Uriah's widow. And so he is now obligated to father a child in order to raise up an offspring to protect and preserve the family line of the deceased. Conveniently, and David and Bathsheba have a baby on the way. And this is not something to now hide. This is something that they can celebrate. He's not only covered up his sin, but he comes out looking like a hero. His reputation among the people has been and would have been well received, but God was not deceived. God looked past his reputation and saw his character. The last part of the last verse of this, our chapter of study says, as I'm closing, but this thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The New American Standard Bible says it this way, but the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. David was my hero growing up. The bravery and audacity he had to face Goliath, uh, the youngest of all his brothers, the smallest of all the soldiers, and yet he was 
fearless, not because of his own ability, I'm speaking to somebody here, but because of his dependency on God. He had experienced God in his own life. He had a personal relationship with God, but this hero messed up badly. And if you would just come with me today to look at modern day superheroes, though they are fictitious, they imitate reality, for they all have their flaws and character defects. Batman is vengeful and anti social. Spider-Man is irresponsible and unreliable. Iron Man is egotistic and narcissistic. And then there's the incredible Hulk. What an incredible mess. He has issues with his temperament and problems with his anger management. But I'm glad to report to you today that there is a hero who is real. He's not Captain America, but he's the captain of our salvation. He's not Superman, but he's God and man. He's not for the thunder God, but he is Jesus, the son of God. Like David, he was born in Bethlehem. Like David, he was anointed and appointed by God. Like David, he was persecuted and then crowned king. David endured Goliath daring Israel for 40 days, but Jesus overcame Satan's testing and temptation in the wilderness for 40 days. David used one stone from five to slay Goliath, but Jesus used one book from five to defeat the devil. And so whilst David cut off Goliath's head with a sword, Jesus conquered Satan with the sword of the spirit. Ah, when kings go forth to battle, Jesus took Deuteronomy from the first five books of the Bible and recited and repeated, it is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus, the faithful kinsman redeemer. Jesus, the one who left his royal home to face the foe so that he could subdue that old serpent. He was in Innocent, but someone had to die. And so whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like Uriah, Jesus was the faithful and humble servant, the one who is the light of the world, the one who is innocent but dies for the guilty. And just like Uriah was the bearer of his own death. Jesus was the bearer of his own death. He carried uh, that cruel cross up Mount Calvary. Not only was it his death sentence, but it was a message, a message from the king of heaven to all the world that whilst the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There he is hanging on that old rugged cross. Don't only see him, don't only look at him, but watch him. For when he was on that cross, you were on his mind. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he has done for us, that we were guilty and he was innocent and yet he went to Calvary for us. Father, forgive us when we have put our reputations above our character we plead right now to give us the righteous character of Christ. And we thank you, Father God, that Jesus made himself of no reputation to save us. And so we accept that sacrifice. We accept Jesus Christ as our savior once again this morning. May your will be done and carried out in our lives. Thank you, Father, that because someone had to die, Jesus gave himself. We praise you, we thank you, we honor you. In the name of our hero, Jesus Christ, amen.